Acts chapter 9, verses 19 through 31 reads, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lured him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. As you take your seat, I want to speak to you from the subject of just do it. Just do it. I know that's Nike's thing, and I ain't trying to steal their saying, but I need us to just do it. People often wonder what God will say on the other side of eternity. Will he be loving? Will he be understanding? What will he think of my life? Well, when I get to heaven, I don't want to just hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want him to say, well done, you overachiever. Living your life for the gospel is worth it. Going to new places to share the good news of Jesus is something you will never regret because the greatest miracle God performs is a changed life. When you're transformed, you can't help but catch the vision to go. When you commit your life to Christ, you commit to a lifelong adventure to go where you've never been before. After Saul's dramatic encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was transformed. Saul, the persecutor, uh, became Saul, the proclaimer. He caught a vision to go and, and proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Son of God. We see a great picture of Saul's zeal as we go and as we delve into this Acts chapter 9 verses. First of all, I want to talk to you about how do we just do it. First of all, you got to have an urgency to go. See, in this passage, we see Saul consumed with one goal, to make Jesus known. Are you consumed with making Jesus known? It turns out he was too hot to handle for those established in their faith. He was rejected and redirected to a safe distance. Yet God never promises safety in living out the gospel. Potential, yes. Purpose, yes. Come on, somebody. Power, yes. But safety, no. To assume living for Jesus is safe is to miss the adventure and intensity of just doing it. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? When you commit your life to Christ, you commit to a lifelong adventure to go where you've never been before. But this adventure also comes at a price. We have seen the price take place at Emmanuel AME Church in Charlottesville, South Carolina and other places of worship because they represent the hope and liberty Christ brings to an oppressed people. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The disciples were skeptical of Saul. The Jews were lethal. The city 
was dangerous, yet nothing could stop Saul from powerfully, fearfully, fearlessly, and boldly proclaiming Jesus. This is how we must be in the Christian, as a Christian people, black and white, and everybody in between. We have got to stand up for what is right. We cannot cover, we cannot cower down in the face of a racist system that offers little to no justice to oppress minorities. As Saul moved from persecutor to proclaimer, he grew in his commitment to urgency of the goal, and we must do it also. Repeatedly throughout scripture, we are told to go. In fact, the word go shows up more than 1,400 times in the Bible. We can never mistake the Bible as an encouraging inactivity. Come on, somebody. Christianity is not a spectator sport. If you bored, you ain't doing nothing. Look at these examples. Abram, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's house to a land I would show you. Isn't it interesting that God gave him a place to go, but didn't even tell him where he was going, told you to just leave what's behind and just move somewhere. This is just like our relationship in Christ. We experience a new life, yet we aren't sure where we're being led to. God wants us to live in the journey and be willing to go, even if we're not not sure where he's leading us. Moses, he said, and so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses was, was not the cream of the crop. Moses couldn't talk right. Moses had a, had a stuttering problem. Moses was tongue-tied. Mo, M- M- Moses couldn't never hardly get his words out. He, he irritated people when he talked and he had a temper problem but God told him I need you to go and and deal with my people what excuses do you have for not going where it is God is sending you God used a whole bunch of incompetent ungifted unqualified people in fact Paul was upset that God had the audacity to use Peter because Peter was uneducated Peter was not a learned man and Paul was like how in the world are you going to use this foolishness over here? Don't worry about what people think about you. Just hang around people that encourage you to go. Jonathan told his armor bearer, but let's go up here and fight these Philistines. Let's climb up this mountain and go fight all of them at the same time. And his armor bearer said, okay, let's go. Come on, somebody. You got to hang with some ride or die Christians. You can't hang around Christians that are so, so, so apathetic and don't want to do anything for Jesus. I can't stand going to a whole bunch of different pastoral meetings where all we do is talk about what we going to do. If you ain't going to get up off your blessed assurance and do something, I can't hang around you. I have to hang around some people that's ready to get into the fight that won't cower down in the midst of controversy. And Ananias, the Lord, told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. I'm sure Ananias, the reason why he asked him, he said, hold on, you you really want me to go talk to Saul? You know he here to kill me, right, God? And, and you know, sometimes God will ask you to do some crazy things that put yourself in imminent danger. God will ask you to do some things that makes no sense to anybody, not even yourself. But Ananias asked God, and God told him clearly, I need you to go over, and I need you to heal Saul because I'm going to show him what he's going to suffer because of my name. These are just a few examples of people who will had to go. Saul was redirected to Tarsus because he was in danger. Only been saved two weeks. <laughs> people are already trying to kill him. We don't know whether he chose to go or was forced to go. It would have been easy for Saul to feel like quitting. It would have been easy for him to think that he misheard God's call. Yet Saul gave God the benefit of the doubt. Even though conditions were not perfect, the goal was still urgent. See, following the goal, it's, it, 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 it is about more than just geography. Followers of Christ 
are the call to go in every sense of the word. We go out uh, our way to love our neighbor. We go to new levels in our faith. In some seasons of life, your primary calling is to go into your own household and be the light of God there. We go wherever there are people living without the hope we have in Christ, whether it's across the globe or across the street. So we have to see the urgency of go. And if you've been following Jesus for a while, you probably understood the call to go. But, but for so many of us, we just miss our go moments. Today, God is calling you to go. And I pray that you will be willing to follow the call to respond to the love of God by going to the world he loves so much. I realize why so many church folk get scared and frustrated about the vision we have to move because so many people don't want to go nowhere. They don't want to go nowhere ge geographically. They don't want to go nowhere in their relationship. They don't want to go nowhere in their careers. They don't want to go nowhere in their life. They so content with the same situation because they know how it's going to happen. If you switch the choirs up on Sunday, they go out their mind because they want to come here and see the same rote memory and the same situation they see every time. They come on first Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, fourth Sunday, fifth Sunday. They don't want any changes because so many people are allergic to getting up off their blessed assurance and doing something for God. Because why? Whenever you do something for God, you get the devil's attention and the devil gonna come for you. The devil is not gonna come for you when you're not doing nothing. He don't have time to waste his, his resources on you. He doesn't have time to waste his demons on you. He don't have time to waste his time on you. The devil can only kill, steal, and destroy. He can't create any more demons. He can't create any more minions. He can't create any more followers. Only thing he can do is kill, steal, and destroy. He don't have time to use his stolen products on you if you ain't doing nothing. But the minute you step up and say, I'm going to do something for God, the devil is right there at your back door, baby. Some of y'all mad when you walked down the aisle and gave your life to Jesus because hell didn't really break out in your life until you made the situation, until you made it known that for God you lived and for God you died. You didn't have no problems. You didn't have no messed up relationship. You didn't have anybody hating you on your job. But the minute you walked out of darkness into the marvelous light, the devil begin to attack you because now you're not on his team. He was all in your life and you was already on your way to hell so he didn't have time to mess with you. But the minute you stepped out of his kingdom, there he go. Oh, I want to give you some roadblocks that cause you not to want to go and make you get into a place where you don't want to just do it. Living for Christ among the shadows of your past. So was the up and coming Pharisee. He, he, his greatest accolade was supervising the killing of Stephen by a mob of his people. As we said before, he'd gone to Damascus on a mission to imprison and persecute the Christians. Acts 9 21 says it this way All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? When we respond to God's goal, we get a fresh start with Jesus. But people aren't quick to forget. Sometimes you fall right back into what you used to do to the family who knew you by your character flaw, to the business you built dishonestly, to the friends who knew you for your sins. See, Saul ended up preaching to Jesus to the Jews that he had killed some of their family members. See, you gotta learn how to forget about your past. Do you know your future don't care about your past? Do you know your future does not care about your past? The only thing that holds you back is because you keep looking in the past. You keep trying to to hold on to past failures. Anytime I see somebody that always try to bring up how I was at Georgia Southern, I get in the Baptist finger and I walk away. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I ain't got time to listen to you about how I used to be and how I used to do this and how I used to do all this stuff. I still fall every now and then because we all fall short of the glory of God, but I'm not going to let you hold an anchor to my neck and keep me tied to my past. What's your excuse? Stop worrying about people talking about you. They mess up just like you. What I've discovered is some of the most judgmental people have the worst lives you've ever seen before. 
If you could just be a fly on the wall. Yeah, the people that talk about you, the people that always coming against you, those the people a lot of times that got the mess, the most messed up lives, but long as just keep minding your own business. Don't worry about trying to figure out what's wrong with them. Just know from your pastor, something wrong. You know why? Because something wrong with everybody. Uh-huh. I don't talk about no other pastor. Because I don't want my stuff on the news. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? See, see, some of y'all, when people fall, everybody want to run to it and retweet it and repost it and tell everybody, look at Pastor so-and-so and look at what Sister so-and-so did. Let them people business ha have their business because judge not so ye not be judged. I ain't going to judge nobody, baby, because I don't want to be judged. Stop letting people hold you back. To live in the shadows of your past. Your future has nothing to do with your past. Feeling unprepared to be used by God is another roadblock. One of the biggest questions when God calls us to go is often how long am I supposed to wait to prepare before I act on the go? Uh, this text we read and gives us great insight into how Saul prepared to respond to his calling. He ate to regain strength, spent time with the disciples, and then went out. The reference to Saul eating represents growing to a place of health before we're sent out. Sometimes God calls us, but we have unhealthy relationships, addictions, and repetitive sins that keep spiritually, uh, us spiritually malnourished. To respond to God's call on our life and to live out the goal, we must get healthy spiritually and emotionally. Remember that health doesn't mean perfection, but rather a growing obedience to the standard of God. You understand? You all, we all fall short, but you should be improving day by day. You're never going to be sinless, but you need to sin less. You feel me? Never going to be sinless. It's not going to happen. And those who say they sinless, lying. But you should sin less. You should sin less tomorrow than you do today. You feel me? And so go on and so on and so on. All right? Saul spent time with the people who've been following Jesus longer than him. In Damascus, he spent some time with Ananias. In Jerusalem, he went to Peter. Uh, to live and out the go in our lives and, and withstand the roadblocks, we need to be connected to people on a familiar path. You can't hang around people that know less than you all the time. You need to hang around some biblical scholars. You can't hang around people that don't know. I was sitting with, no, nah, I ain't going to even say that story. I'm about to say something. Y'all want me to say it, don't you? I was sitting at this table. I hope they ain't watching me on stream. I was sitting at this table with a whole bunch of preachers. And, 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 and Congressman Scott sat down and he was talking about how he didn't have this and had that. And I was like, Proverbs says that, that the proverb says that a rich man pretends to be poor and a poor man pretends to be rich. And every preacher at the table began to say, what Bible you read? And I said, what you talking about? What translation you read? And I said, it's in the Bible. In Proverbs 13, somewhere, 12 or 13, I think it's Proverbs 13, 7. But, but, but I said, it says a, a rich man pretends to have nothing and, and a poor man pretends to have everything. You know how, how poor folk go buy the most expensive jeans? Most expensive cars, but rich folk riding around in pickup trucks and look broke. And that's that what the Bible says. And, and so they begin to, all right, and so I went in and pulled up the scripture. Oh, you must have read that this morning. And I realized I can't hang around them Negroes too much longer. Because you don't read your Bible. Now, I ain't say I know every scripture. But I know that one. A simple one. And the thing about it, if you don't know, just don't say nothing. 
Don't tell me it ain't in there. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. All I'm saying is you got to begin to hang around people that's going to sharpen you and make you better. Paul didn't get out of his mess and go right back to people that hanging in mess. Some of y'all got messed up situations because the minute you get into some mess, you go ask a messy person for advice. How ignorant is that? You mad at somebody and you go to somebody else who mad at them for stupid reasons. Because you just want them to say what you want to hear. You got to begin to hang around some people that's going to help elevate your life and make you a better Christian and help you learn more about the word of God. You need to hang around some people that challenge you spiritually. Paul saw once he got converted, he didn't go back to hanging with the folk that he was killing folk with. He left them and began to hang with other people that were doing what it is that he had a vision from God to do. Stop connecting yourself with vision people that only cause havoc whether they're at your house whether they're at your church whether they're at your job y'all did here at your church part right and so invested in his health and community he prepared to go Acts 9.19 tells us that after he regained his strength, he went at once. When God calls you, the correct response is to make sure you're healthy, connected in the community, well, to the community of believers, and go. You always feel unprepared. Whether you're taking your first step, your second, your 50th or your 100th step, you should never feel all the way prepared. Because first of all, you need to be humble and understand that God is the author and finisher of your faith, not you. He's the one that gives you every good and perfect gift. He's the one that gives you the power to obtain wealth. He is the one. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one. And if you ever feel like you got everything together, that ain't your call. Because your call should be so big. If your call don't scare you, it ain't of God. If your call don't scare you, it's not of God. Because God would do exceedingly abundantly above whatever you can ask, think, or imagine according to the power that works in you. He's an exceeding God, which means when you begin to step into it, your power is not what's going to get it done. Your power is going to help get it started, but God's power is going to bring it to fruition because he's always going to give you a vision bigger than you. See, this, this, this is my thing. I can't do this vision without people. That's why I hate when people... Tell me stuff on Sunday morning like that. I can't do stuff without sound. I can't do stuff without the choir. I can't do stuff without the trustees. I can't do stuff without the deacons. I can't do stuff without social media. I can't do stuff without the cameras. You understand? Know and, and that's just one little thing. I see, I don't got to understand. You, you, sometimes we make it, we, we over get, we get so deep with it. But whenever God gives, if I can do, I can't do this by my, I can't get in here, set up social media, set up the sound room, set up the camera, sing the songs, play the organ, play the drums. I, I'm just giving you a simple thing so you can understand what I'm saying. When it's a vision of God, you can't do it by yourself. That's simple, I know, but I'm just trying to bring it so you can see what I'm saying. How about I look? I sit up in here, I preach, I be the audience, I be the sound team, I be the deacons, I be the trustees, I be the social media, I be the camera on the front, the camera in the back, I be the male chorus, I be the praise team. You can't do a vision that God gives you by yourself. It should overwhelm you. It should bring you to the point that if you don't be a relationship, you won't be able to take it to the next level that God has I'm through with that one another one is not understanding God's plan Saul struggled to understand why God would use Peter remember I just talked about it an uneducated unsuccessful fisherman to fulfill his plan the reality is knowing Jesus is this the more mature you become in your faith, the less you think it's your job to know what the next step should be. Look, Ecclesiastes 11.5 says it well. Trustee Shaw says, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. There are many who, walk, who will walk away from the goat and won't just do it. 
in their life because they want to understand every step before they step. God said if you're faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. If you don't take the first step, he's not going to tell you what the second and third step is. If you don't step out when he first tells you to step out, he's not going to give you further instruction. Let the word of the, the, the God is like us following God like a scavenger hunt. Right. If you don't find that first clue, you ain't going to win. You got to find the first clue. First clue leads to the second clue. Second clue leads to the third clue. Third clue leads to the fourth clue and so on and so on. You feel me? So that first step leads to the second step. The second step leads to the third step. And the problem is a lot of us are waiting on God to give us every bit of information before we step. Oh, y'all don't hear me what I'm saying. If God would have gave me a vision when I first got here, when people were telling me, get the vision, write a vision. I said, I can't write a vision down because I don't know the people yet. I can't just make a cookie cutter vision. I can't come in here and say, this is the goal of New Beach Grove Baptist Church. This is the vision. I got to know the personality of the church. I got to know the culture of the church. I got to know where the church has been and where the church is going. I know some people think I don't care about the history, but I do. And I can't worry about the history so much that I get stuck in the past and you just want to sit in the same seat and don't want the church to grow. But I, I can't get caught up in that. But the thing about it is you have to understand it before you put a vision together you understand but but the thing about it if God would have showed me where we were going now when I first got here it would have overwhelmed me I wouldn't have been ready for it in fact there's some stuff that God has us going and me going in my individual life that he ain't gonna show me now he gonna show me when I make the step he tell me to do whenever he tell me to make it but you, you see what I'm saying see, I'm, can I get I'm just serious I'm, God sent me on steps when we talk about the church I'm gonna just give y'all some steps so y'all know the steps steps was we started trying to build some stuff and I look at the steps and we looked at this church over there that wasn't it but we began to meet a loan officer that's helping us now because we didn't get the building but we met the loan officer and the agent that's helping us do other stuff see like a scavenger hunt we had looked at this other building down there didn't even bring it to the church where the other church is going where Calvary is going and God, we didn't look at that, but it made me know when we when we made an offer on they building, eventually they're going to have to come back. Now, I know they said, I don't want to talk about y'all. I love y'all. I know they said God talked to them, but really the bill talked to them. Because I knew it took too much work to put it in. If we hadn't seen that building, I wouldn't have thought. So when we put an offer in for three buildings, even though they were selling two, in my mind, eventually they're going to come back. Because you need money to fix that up. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And even though I was taking it, God said, take the deacons over there. And I knew half of them back then didn't like me no way. But take them over there anyway. Take the deacons and the trustees. Take them. We know you just got here. You ain't been here that long. But take them over here and look at it. You ain't going to take it to the church. We ain't never take it to the church. But I just need you to go so you can see who with you and who not with you. It's a scavenger hunt. And when I took that step, then it led me to another step. And now we led to another step. Then we said, you know what? Let's go ahead and go through with the architects. Because I, and I was remembering in the, in, the, in the meeting, I said, Sean, I think we're supposed to build. I mean, I think we're supposed to buy a building. But should I say something about the architect? He was like, man, might as well go ahead. I said, oh, yeah, we're going to go ahead. and We're going to try to build something. Then we started the process. They said it was going to be $3 million. Then they came up with $4.5 million. Like, well, how you go up $1.5 million in one email? And so we began to say, okay, that ain't the right way to go. But God told me to take that step, and I took that step. So then we came back, and we said, oh, man, over here, they're going to give us this for three million. Well, all the first, all the And the thing about it is, I never would have given an offer of all three buildings, even though, in fact, I know they got mad, even though they were selling two, if I had not already seen the other building down the street, that I knew they had to put more money in. You see what I'm saying? It didn't make no sense to people that don't understand the vision of God. The problem is, you just got to walk Walk out how God says it. He may not let you stop right there, but you got to make that step so he can give you the whole panoramic view of the vision. If I didn't go way down the street, it's about the land of the building I knew we could afford. I knew we couldn't fix up. I never would have known that they can't fix it up without selling a building either. You got to make the steps that God orders in your life. And then he, oh, see, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Didn't make no sense to you, did it? 
didn't make no sense. Didn't make no sense to me. It don't matter if it makes sense or not. You got to learn how to follow the man of God as he follows God. If I ain't following God, by all means, don't follow me. Have a voting session and have two-thirds of the folk send me on that midnight train back to Georgia. But as long as I'm listening to the Holy Ghost, as I step, you need to step when I move. I almost want to go to the rap song, but I know. <laughs> when I move you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Another roadblock is knowing God's plan will bring pain. Ooh, what a roadblock. Some of us don't like shots. We don't want to go to the doctor because the shots hurt. Lord, it'll make you better sometimes. I ain't going to say all the time. God doesn't spare us from hardship whenever we just do it and go. Even though we accomplish great things, it won't negate the pain. Ooh, don't you hate it? But you know what? When I played football, every, for mama made me stop playing. I don't get hurt. Still mad at her for that. Catch the ball, get hit. It hurt when you hold it, but it hurt worse when you drop it. Woo, Jesus. Now you get hit, it hurt. You can walk it off a little better when you catch it. When you drop it, oh, Lord. You're going to experience pain whether you work for God or not. The pain going to be there, but when you look over the goodness of your life, and begin to look at all the blessings God gave you because he said I bless you when you obedient to me I prosper you I give you a good measure blessing press down shake it together and run it over I bless you a hundredfold in this lifetime with persecution the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike but at least if you're doing something for God you got a whole bunch of blessings to offer uh -oh, your pain look 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 Saul spent just two weeks in Jerusalem, then had to sneak out the city. Two weeks. I think I was here more than two weeks before people were trying to send me out. But it didn't take long. Church started growing. People started growing. People started, folk, some folk told me uh, that they left the church because the church was growing too fast and too many people were getting saved. Jesus, help me, Lord. They said, well, what you tell them? Bye. What else could I say? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're going to get persecuted when you work for God. People don't persecute folk who not doing nothing. Successful people get the persecution. If nobody knows who you are, if you're not doing anything but God, you won't have any pain. That's why some church folk want to sit in the pew. See, we talk about the prodigal son that left. What, what about the product of sun that didn't never go nowhere? See, y'all, y'all, I'm looking at it on the flip side of that, of that. One of the product of sons left, but another product of sons stayed at home. Even though he stayed in church and sat in the pew, he ain't never do nothing for the father. The father was excited that the son came back, and he wasn't even excited that his, that his brother came back to church. I know you look at it like the house, but I look at that like God is really the father and this a wayward person, but at least they went out. Some of us ain't going nowhere. Sitting in the same chair, same pew, same place every Sunday. But don't do nothing for God. Nothing for your neighbor. Nothing for nobody. Show up to funerals to eat the snacks. <laughs> don't never go to the grave site. Just sitting waiting by the door to eat. Just like Ahab. See, that was wrong with church folk. Remember when, 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 when the rain came, Elijah said, tell Ahab, it sounds like rain. Tell him to go on and go eat because I know he greedy. Some folk don't never want to give. All they want to do is eat. 
not just eat food. They want to eat off everybody's plate, everybody's anointing, everybody's sacrifice, everybody's blessing, but never want to bring anything to the table to eat, just a knife and a fork. You got to get rid of them knife and fork people out of your life that don't bring no chicken, that don't bring no spiritual blessing, that don't bring no prayer. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Knowing God's plan it will bring you pain is a roadblock. But look at, look at Paul. Paul had been beaten inches of his life. In fact, Paul died a martyr's death. But Paul said in Philippians 1.29, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Embracing God's command will cost you something. But he's going to bless you because God said, Jesus said, if you don't suffer with me, you won't reign with me. If you ain't going to suffer with me, you, you can't reign with me. You got to be careful of people that come to you after you already reigning. You got to bring up some people that were suffering in the trenches with you. Some people before they knew your name. Jesus said, if you don't suffer with me, you, you, you can't reign with me. Old school is saying like this, no cross, no, no crown. You got to go through some suffering, some pain. See, the pain and suffering builds character in you. It gets to change. You show me somebody who has a lot of money but ain't been through no suffering, I'll show you somebody that can lose it tomorrow. You show me somebody that's been through some suffering before they got successful, if they do lose their blessing tomorrow, they'll get it back the next day. The reality is that God has a goal for every one of us today. He isn't a passive God. He's active. Jesus spoke about a heavenly father who loves the people of the world so much that he would go from the 99 to save the one. He chose this crazy, overzealous Pharisee named Saul to become his leader in the early church. A man who almost got himself killed two weeks into following his call. For most of us in the room, the goal or to just do it isn't to become a missionary or to put your life on the line tomorrow. For many of you, the goal is to becoming a better parent. The goal is starting a faith-filled conversation at work tomorrow. The goal is writing a check for one of God's sons or daughters across the world. For some of you, the goal is to get healthy so God can give you a greater goal. Some of us are in bad health, but we ain't eating right and we ain't exercising. You know you, your, your house or your body is a temple of God and you need to take care of the temple of God. And the reason why God wants you to take care of the temple of God so you can live a long life and continue to work for him. You won't have all the answers. You might not know where the money will come from. You might be called crazy and you'll probably be terrified in the process. But when we go, we don't go alone. In your goal, there was a greater awareness of Jesus. In your goal, there was a greater sense of the reason you're here. And if we all respond to our own goal, I believe God would do more in the next generation than the world has ever seen. Technology. Periscope, Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. We can share the gospel with the biggest of folk around the world. Through organizations like One Hope and the collaboration of churches around the world, every people, every people group in the world will have access to the gospel in the next decade. Hollywood even making movies because once they saw they can make movies off Christian money off Christian movies, they start putting them in the movie theater. Hollywood don't care if you believe in God or not. They want to know what's going to bring them money. And now they realize that even gospel, even gospel music, and they realize that, that gospel movies and Christian movies bring money to them. Now they even spreading the God. They might not be doing it for the right reason, but we don't care. We're going to be like Paul. Paul said when people came to him and talk about how people were doing this and they was doing it and they was preaching Jesus, but they weren't doing it for the right reason. Saul said, I don't care why they're doing it. As long as they're preaching Jesus, heaven and hell up to God. As long as they're preaching Jesus and doing the right theology, I don't care if they're doing it for money. 
I don't care if they're doing it for the fame. That's between them and God. They heart between them and God. But I need them to get the gospel out there. I don't care why Hollywood put a movie out there. I don't care why Periscope let us use it for free. I don't care that all the other mess on there. But what we going to do is infiltrate the territory and kick in the gates of hell because we supposed to be offensive. I'm tired of the church being on defense. The reason why the devil is always in the church causing problems and everybody judging everybody because you thought this was the game. This ain't the game. This the locker room, baby. You come in here and the coach give you a pep talk and you go out into the world and you make changes. You go out in the periscope. You go out into YouTube. You go out into the highways and byways. You go into the police station. You go into the school. You go into the hospital. You go into your to your corporate organization. You go into your AKAs and your Delta. You go into your Omega Soft Files and your Alpha. You go into every place, every secular place and you infiltrate the territory and you take it from the devil. The Bible says go over 1,400 times. Why are you still sitting in your chair? Why are you still sitting in the same place? Why you ain't doing nothing for God? God didn't make you to sit down on your dairy air. He made you uh, to get up off your blessed assurance and do uh, what he called you to do. What are you called to do? Are you called uh, to heal the sick? Uh, are you called uh, to preach the gospel? Are you called to lay hands on folk? What are you called to do? Stop sitting in one place. If you sit on a hospital bed for too long, your muscles begin to get apathy. They lose their definition. They lose their strength. You begin to get bad sores if you never move. Your body stops working efficiently. Digestive system slows down. Circulatory system messes up. Some of us have spiritual apathy. Yeah, we go to the weight room, some of us. Yeah. We go to work and get our check. But what are we doing spiritually? Are we doing what God has called us to do? <laughs> if not, we have in spiritual apathy. And we've been sitting down so long, it's harder for us to get up and go. If you get up every day in the morning, it's easy to get up. But if you stay in your bed for two or three weeks, it's hard to get up. You might need some help. No matter how old or young you are. Just like spiritually, you got to scream and holler. Go crazy. And say he bled and died and, and get you all hyped to get up in Jesus. <laughs> but if you're already moving in the spirit, if you're already going and doing what God has asked you to do, you don't need me to be a cheerleader. You don't need me to hype you up. You don't need a praise team. You don't need an organ. <laughs> you don't need the mics to be just right <laughs> because you are coming here. <laughs> With a praise on your heart. See, your praises, praises shall continually be in my mouth. And let me tell you something. You can't praise nobody you ain't with. You can't praise God if you ain't with him. You can't worship him in spirit and truth if you don't trust him. You got to be connected to him. And when you begin to be connected with him and worship him and praise him, you begin to go where he tells you to go. Captain Kirk ain't got nothing on you. Dr. Spark ain't got nothing on you. You will go where no man or woman has ever gone before. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. The glory that God has in store for your life. The only catch is you got to just do it. Paul was killing the same folk. Can you imagine? I just came in here and tried to shoot all y'all. And came back and be like, you know what? I'm supposed to preach y'all tomorrow. <laughs> Saul probably killed somebody, mom and daddy. Yeah, and he coming in tomorrow. You know what? I'm cool now. <laughs> I know I tried to kill your mama. But I know Jesus now, right? <laughs> That's what he did. Now, they had, he was, this dude was so crazy.
crazy. He stayed crazy for Jesus. And they had to they had to put this man in a basket and get him out the city because he preached to the folk. And it wasn't just it wasn't just sinners trying to kill him. Church folk were trying to kill him. That joker killed my brother. He out here preaching the church. I know the devil is a lie today. Now, Ananias, Jesus talked to you, but he ain't said nothing to me. I'm finna kill this joker. Can you imagine that? He just was killing a family and came to church the next day. You know, I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> you know, man, you know, I know I was putting you out of debt, but we, we good now. If he didn't use that as an excuse, what's your excuse? To be that bold, to come preach to a people that he persecuted. That he shamed. That he had papers in his hand to kill and come back and preach in the same church as they were in. What's your excuse? So what? You used to be a prostitute. So what? You used to be an alcoholic. So what? It doesn't matter what you used to be. In fact, God will use that mess as your ministry. Let me tell you something. And I'm a I'm going to preach this one day. I think I preached it before. I'm going to preach it again. The reason why Moses was able to walk in Egypt and out is because he had enough Egypt on him. He was in the same schools, went to the same clubs, smoked the same weed, messed with the same women. So when he walked in, they didn't kill him. Let my people go. No, all right, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> he had that mess on him. And some of us got mess on us for a reason. God allowed you to go through that and gave you grace and mercy so when he delivered you out of it, you'll be able to relate to that alcoholic. You'll be able to relate to that heroin addict. You better relate to that prostitute. You better relate to that liar. And then you can tell them how God helped you make it over. Whatever you've gone through, it's not for your shame. It's for glory of God. Stop letting people make you feel bad about what you used to do. Stop letting people make you feel bad of what you used to be. Stop letting people make you feel bad you used to be messed up. Right? Don't let them make you feel bad when you mess up today. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's no excuses. You just got to be like Nike and just do it. When God calls you, move immediately. And don't worry about your mistakes. Don't worry about your infirmities or your setbacks. Get up off your blessed assurance and do what God has called you to do. Thank you.